The president's lecture was created to give our students, faculty, staff, and fellow Oberlin residents the opportunity to hear speakers from our outstanding faculty, as well as from our alumni family, share their expertise and insights. The midday time is an homage to Oberlin's long history of noontime assemblies that were mandatory. The hope is that people whose schedules might otherwise prevent them from hearing our honorees will be able to attend. Today's speaker is David Orr. He is the Paul Sears Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and Politics, as well as serving as special assistant to me. Um, he is a prolific writer and author on sustainability, climate change, and politics. His most recent book, which I'm sure is available at the local bookstore, is Hope is an Imperative, The Essential David Orr. For more than 25 years, he has served as a board member advisor to some of the world's leading environmental organizations, including the Rocky Mountain Institute, the Bioneers, and the World Watch Institute. He has been awarded seven honorary degrees and a dozen other awards, including a National Achievement Award from the National Wildlife Federation, and recently a Visionary Leadership Award from Second Nature. Professor Orr has lectured at hundreds of colleges and universities throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia and he headed the effort that resulted in the design, funding, and build, building of our own Adam Joseph Lewis Center, which has been named one of 30 milestone buildings of the 20th century by the United States Department of Energy. In short, David Orr is and has been a tireless leader in combating climate change, promoting sustainability and social justice in Oberlin, in the United States, and around the world. His talk today is entitled, Only Connect, a fourth gyre or gyre, David? Explain. You'll explain. <laughs> so my ignorance is not, is not completely without basis. OK, um, a wonderful human being and a good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor David Orr. Those of you who have never seen me in a suit before, uh, let me say that Gibsons will rent you anything. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is I have to have it back to them folded in a box at 1 o'clock. Uh, Marvin, thank you for the, uh, the, the kind introduction. It's been a, uh, an honor to work with Marvin for the past 15 years, and that's a joke if you're on the inside. Uh, but Marvin, thank you for not only the words, but for uh, steady and very principled leadership at a time when it's difficult to be a college president. So thank you very much for those six and a half years. It has been an honor to work with you. Um, I want to say a word about Adam and, and Peter Lewis. If you look at the good things that have happened here relative to sustainability, the Adam Joseph Lewis Center, and 11 uh, acre uh, PV array, uh, the East College Street Project, now the Gateway Project, their fingerprints are all over that. And they have been uh, generous donors, and we owe them a great deal. And Roger Lashman, I can't think of a better person to hold that chair. And I'm really proud of you and glad that you're in that role. And I'll send you a memo on what that role entails <laughs> later. And I want to thank my uh, co-author, Elaine Orr, uh, who is behind most all the, the words uh, here. And that allows me to blame her for any of the words that aren't quite on target. Um, now, the, the title is uh, Only Connect a Fourth Gyre. Uh, Only Connect is the epigraph to uh, E.M. Forster's wonderful little 1910 novel, Howard's End. He doesn't say necessarily how to connect or what to connect, but only connect. And then a gyre is uh, basically a flow of water in a circle. It comes from the, the Latin uh, word, which just means revolve. So let's get down to work. Uh, in the middle of the North Pacific, there's a mass of floating plastic debris and chemical sludge caught in ocean currents that are described as the North Pacific Gyre. It covers an area estimated to be between the size of Texas to twice the size of the lower 48 states. It extends downward in the water column, maybe 100 feet, maybe 1,000 feet. The fact is, no one really knows. Some of the most amazing things humans have ever made float in what has been renamed as the North Pacific Garbage Gyre. They're made mostly of oil extracted from deep below the surface of the earth, another considerable source of amazement. 
Six miles above our head, there's a second gyre, the result of burning every year four cubic miles of primeval goo. Ancient sunlight congealed in the form of coal and oil and tar sands and natural gas. The atmospheric residues of burning that, chiefly carbon dioxide, reached 400 parts per million in May of this year. The highest concentration in hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps several million years. The result is changing the heat balance of the Earth at an unprecedented rate, locking us into a future of extreme heat, drought, larger storms, rising sea levels, and changing ecologies that will imperil economies, public health, social, and political stability. And that is to say, civilization. A third gyre circles through all of us in this room, our bloodstream, and lodges in our fatty tissues. A typical sample of chemicals in your body would include perhaps 200 or more substances that are suspected or known to cause cancers, cell mutations, endocrine system disruption, and possibly behavioral changes. In the words of the President's cancer panel, babies are born pre-polluted compromised by substances that come through their mother's umbilical cord. Three gyres, <clears throat> and they have many things in, in common. They are first vicious cycles, or what is called wicked problems, that are complex, long-term, non-linear. It's simply a fancy way to say that they're unpredictable with lots of unknowns. They involve virtually every discipline in this college, but they're not so much problems that can be solved as they are dilemmas that can't be solved, but with foresight could have been avoided. Number two, each is long-lived with effects that will last hundreds to thousands of years. Number three, the causes of each gyre were known a long time ago. The first warning of impending climate change, for example, was given to Lyndon Johnson in 1965. Nearly a half a century later, we still have no de jure climate policy and carbon dioxide is accumulating faster than ever before. Last year, 2.2 parts per million. Number four, the consequences of pollution gyres were not understood and still not understood except partially in hindsight. In Wendell Berry's words, we did not know what we were doing because we didn't know what we were undoing. Number five, in each case, better alternatives exist and were known long ago, but they were stopped by money, political dysfunction, and sometimes by the lack of imagination. It is profitable for some to create a throwaway economy. It is highly profitable to extract, sell, and burn fossil fuels that are diminishing the human future almost by the hour. It is profitable to pollute our air and water and undermine human health. And that is to say that these three gyres aren't accidents. They're not anomalies, but the logical working out of a system of ideas and philosophy embedded deeply in our culture, our politics, our economy, and our education. Number six, the causes were once thought to be a good thing. The evidence of prosperity measured as economic growth. But in fact, we were never rich, as rich, as we presumed ourselves to be. We were just loading, offloading the costs of pollution onto others living somewhere else or at some later time. Number seven, collectively these three gyres of pollution are facets of what's being called the sixth great extinction spasm. But this time it's not about dinosaurs, it's about us. Number eight, there is no effective legal penalty for the destruction of oceans or climate stability or human health or actions at risk civilization for a few more years of profit. We grant no rights of life and liberty and property to our posterity or to other species. Number nine. Finally, and this is where the controversy begins, finally, if you trace the causes of each gyre back far enough, you'll find a young student in a classroom learning powerful ideas and acquiring the skills necessary to the extractive economy. They're the heirs of Descartes and Bacon and Galileo and those who dreamed of total human mastery over nature. We've equipped our graduates with tools and technology necessary to, quote, affect all things possible, as Francis Bacon, one of the architects of the, the modern mind, put it. We've done that very well. Accordingly, students learn how to dismantle the world into its pieces, but not why that was mostly a bad idea, or even how to reassemble the parts. 
We often fail to provide an ecological or ethical context for what was being taught. And as a result, we understand more than we comprehend. The gyres of disintegration aren't the work of the uneducated, but rather the educated. People with PhDs and MBAs and LLBs and master's degrees and baccalaureate degrees. In other words, the ecological and climate disorder we see around us reflects a prior disorder in how we think and what we think about and what we can think about. That makes it the business of all of us in, quote, the education industry, the telling phrase, who purport to improve thinking. But to improve thinking, we must address problems of education, not merely those in education. No amount of tinkering at the margins of any discipline or the entire curriculum will help. The irony, of course, is that the same education and science and technology that poses a threat to life on Earth also gave us the capacity to discern the effects of our action, to measure it, to chart it, to understand what we were doing, and perhaps to change course. Ian Forster admonished us only to connect. But the fact is, we're already connected. The greatest discoveries of the 20th century in one way or another reveal that we're stitched together in more ways than we can know. 99.5% of our genes are identical, but we spend 99.5% of our time fighting over the remaining 0.5% of difference. We share 98% of our genes with our nearest kin, the large apes and bonobos. We're not so much individuals as we are a congress of bacteria and virus and other hitchhikers that make up 90% of our bodies, excluding water. Every breath we take includes molecules once breathed by Socrates or Shakespeare or Sojourner Truth or Idi Amin, for that matter. We are emotionally connected to nature, what Harvard biologist Dio Wilson calls biophilia, an innate affinity for life and lifelike processes. And all of us are made of stuff that was once in stars. We're now connected as never before in Facebook and emails and smartphones, and some of you, of course, are tweeting right now. The world once predicted by theologian and philosopher Tyre de Chardin, which he described as the news fear, this thickening web of communication and intelligence blanketing the earth. And we're connected over time as a small part of the vast enterprise of life that stretches back 3.8 billion years and as far forward as the angels of our better nature, luck, and sunlight will permit. But we've reached a transition point in the human journey. We can't continue on our present course. The time necessary to avoid the worst ahead is very short. Cambridge University astronomer Royal Martin Rees calls this century our final hour. He gives odds of no more than 50-50 that civilization will survive to the year 2100. Indeed, any high school student could make a long list of plausible ways by which humankind could self-destruct with a whimper or a bang. But trends aren't destiny. We're not fated to destroy ourselves. It is rather a choice, and the choices we must make to build a far better future than that in prospect are well known. Economist David Corton calls this the great turning. In the next few decades, we must eliminate 90% or more of our carbon emissions and make a rapid transition away from fossil fuels and toward a wiser and more resilient energy base of efficiency and renewable energy. That's going to be hard on Americans because we, on average, emit about 22 tons of carbon per person per year. The next few years, we must sequester forever a large fraction of the present fossil fuel reserves that cannot be burned if we are to have a 50-50 chance of preserving habitable Earth. I want to stop right there and say this. Two degrees centigrade warming has been said for a long time to be the guardrail. Beyond that, all bets are, are off. Uh, that's the scientific opinion. John Holdren, uh, the president's, uh, President uh, Obama's science advisor, says two degrees centigrade warming, and that's beyond that, uh, all hell can break loose. And that is to keep us within a 50-50 chance of survival. But think about that just for a moment. You wouldn't get into a car with a 50% chance of a fatal accident. But now we talk about the whole planet and for all time as we would measure time. There's a 50-50 chance of survival at two degrees centigrade. And for the most part, the scientific community, I think, would agree that there, there is uh, not much chance that we'll stop the two degrees centigrade warming to go on. 
Those fossil fuel reserves must be removed from the positive side of the economic ledger, but in ways that do not collapse the global economy. Our choices are to compensate present owners by buying them out, more or less what the British did to end slavery, or confiscate, simply seize the asset, or thirdly, render them unsaleable because there are better alternatives. We must create a fair, decent, ecologically durable economy that lifts two billion people out of extreme poverty, provides safe drinking water for three billion, creates opportunities for women, and guarantees basic human rights of food, health care, safety, and good education for children. The point is that we often lose sight of. We must understand that we pay for sustainability and justice whether we get it or not. We can pay less now uh, in precaution or more later. In an age of corruption and media manipulation, we must begin the task of building a true and robust democracy. We must educate and energize a literate and thoughtful citizenry and engage them in the noble calling of public service. For too long, we've marinated in the odd belief that government is the problem, as if Enron or WorldCom or Lehman Brothers or Koch Brothers, for that matter, or limited secret money that corrupts elec elections were not problems. The result is the atrophy of the public capacity to solve public problems. Our challenge in the decades ahead is to rebuild responsive and responsible governments at all levels and protect the rights of future generations. To do such things, we must begin, as George Orwell once said, by reclaiming our words and our language. For example, how was it that the word patriotism became confused with driving sport utility vehicles with flags and violent bumper stickers and gun racks? How did it become patriotic to assassinate remotely by drone or to maintain 735 military bases around the world? And how did the word conservative come to mean the willingness to run a risk of destroying the planet in order to save markets? So what is Oberlin's role in the Great Turning? Well, it's similar to what it has been from its founding. Our role is to provide the best education of any liberal arts college in the country, to energize yet another generation of game changers, young people who devote their lives and their considerable intelligence to make the world better and to serve those who need help the most in the process to cause, as the Irish say, a fierce commotion, and we're good at that. But we must do more. Now more than ever, we need liberally educated young people who know how and what to connect, how to solve for pattern, how to design systems of solutions that accelerate change, that multiply by positive feedback and synergy. We need designers of a fourth gyre that turns vicious cycles into virtuous cycles of politics, economics, urban planning, finance, architecture, engineering, water systems, landscapes, transportation, social justice, energy, food systems, and education. What is our role as a college in the long emergency ahead? Well, it is what it has always been, to boldly enlarge our ideas of education and research, to meet the challenges, the unprecedented challenges, and opportunities of the time, to lead with courage, and persistence. This can only begin with a large conversation about education that engages the entire campus community, that asks questions beyond conventional categories, questions that have no easy answers, questions that force us out of our comfort zones and conventional categories of thought and behavior. Second, we should set a goal that no one should graduate from Oberlin as an ecological illiterate without knowing how the world works as a physical system and why that's important for their lives. We'd be very disturbed to graduate students who couldn't read or couldn't count. By the same logic, we should be disturbed when they graduate illiterate of how the world works, and they should know accordingly the basics of ecology and thermodynamics and systems dynamics and many more things. Third, we should become the kind of organization that not only advances learning, but itself learns relative to how the world works as a physical system, what MIT professor Peter Senge calls a learning organization. That means making sustainability the normal and easy thing to do, the default setting for how we educate, build, spend, invest, so that we do not destroy or undermine the earth our students will inherit. And we should do these things with a sense of urgency. This is no time for complacency. In Martin Luther King's words, we're confronted with a fierce urgency of now. There is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. 
Life often leaves us standing bare and naked and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men doesn't remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or neglect. And now to students. You live in a world of 7.2 billion people. That will grow in your lifetime to nine or maybe 10. These are people armed with nuclear weapons and divided by ancient hatreds. You'll live in the early years of the, what's being called the Anthropocene, with all the dangers on one side and the opportunities on the other. Ian Forster didn't say how to connect, but he did say that it all turns on affection. And affection is different than curiosity or raw intelligence. Affection will move you to cultivate a sense of wonder. Einstein put it this way, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Affection will cause you to celebrate mystery. Amidst all the facts, theories, analysis, and data, there is the inexplicable. D.H. Lawrence, for example, said that water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, but there's a third thing that makes it water, and no one knows what that is. Affection will change your perspectives. So major in paradox, in irony, in the tragic sense of life. Master the art and science by which we've risen above tragedy and move the cause of justice like a mighty river. Affection changes and conditions intelligence. Smartness alone will never be enough. Ignorance is part of the human condition, not a problem that could be solved by more research. Learn the difference between being right or thinking yourself to be right and being genuinely right and effective. It is so easy to think we're right. If you take a deep breath in Oberlin, uh, you become very, very certain of something or other, not always the same thing. Learn to be a little less certain of your certainties. Effectiveness requires civility and kindness. Robert Coles, the, the great Harvard psychologist, gave a commencement talk here years ago. He concluded it by saying, be kind to each other, and he repeated that phrase over and over. So be kind to each other. Being effective requires stamina that comes from a long view that can see hope on a farther horizon. And from time to time, laugh at yourself, puncture your own, our own ingrained sense of pomposity. See the comic side of our plight. And if you can't laugh at us, you aren't taking things seriously enough. And recently it came to my attention that uh, some Oberlin students have learned what is called the F word. I know your parents are shocked. We were shocked in Cox Billing. But for you students, remember that you can use obscenities to good effect only maybe five times in your life. <laughs> Don't blow your quota here at Oberlin. <laughs> and finally, if you're optimistic or in total despair, you don't have to do anything. But there's another choice, hope. But if you're hopeful, you're required to act. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. In conclusion, we share a grand heritage in history. Long ago, Oberlin took a brave stand for decency and human dignity and equal opportunity and access. But now those ideals hinge on the preservation of the biosphere. It's said that whatever your cause, it's a lost cause on a degraded and dying planet. All the proud achievements of this college have only been a preparation for the work we must now do. Our finest hour as a college, as a city, and as people lie ahead of us in the great work of restoration and the enhancement of life, and advancing the cause of justice as far out in time as you can imagine. So in Goethe's words, whatever you can do, or think you can, begin it. For boldness has genius, and magic, and power. But whatever you do, remember to connect with each other, with life, with hope, and with the ground you stand on. I think you're the kind of people that will. Thank you.